Nestled in the hills of southern Indiana is the Northwoods Institute. This unique building was the West Baden Springs Hotel when it was built in 1902. Since then, it's been an army hospital, a gambling casino, a Jesuit seminary, and now a school of hotel and restaurant management. Last summer, it hosted the FAI World Championships of Indoor Model Flying. The atrium at Northwoods is one of the best indoor flying sites anywhere. An excellent choice for the World Championships. 34 flyers from 12 nations entered the competition, which is held every two years. The atrium has a 98-foot ceiling and a 200-foot circular mosaic tile floor with six stories of rooms completely surrounding it. The 130-foot building was once the largest unsupported dome in the world. Some of its past elegance still lingers. The United States was well represented. Veteran modelers Pete Andrews, Ray Harlan, and Irv Rodemsky gave the U.S. a real chance for the championship. Jim Richmond won the individual world champion title in Cardington, England two years ago. Although he did not qualify for the U.S. team, he flew as defending champion. In this competition, all models are rubber-powered and winners are determined solely on duration of flight. Under the rules, the wingspan can be no greater than 65 centimeters. The model must weigh at least one gram, not counting the rubber which powers them. If the scale tips, it indicates one gram, approximately the weight of a dollar bill. These microfilm covered planes are so delicate that they can only be flown indoors. Here Andreas Vogel of the Swiss team uses a geared winder and a torque meter to wind his motor for launching. The motor is actually a loop of rubber about 17 inches long, which may be wound more than 2,000 turns. The launch torque is a critical factor to these flyers and varies with each individual and their model design. Once launched, the models are on their own. They're built to fly very slowly in a circular pattern, with the propeller turning slower than once per second. The Swiss team models are an unusual design, as team manager Maurice Bodmer explains. Uh, it's, uh, this model has a very long fuselage, and the uh, fuselage is a rough a meter length. And uh, this model was uh, designed either for the aerodynamic characteristic and for strength by uh, different computers programs. And who designed it? Uh, Dieter Siebener, but for the construction for different details. Uh, Beauty and later uh, Vogel, the chap flying now, did a uh, very contribute to a small uh, uh, amount of details. Uh, for example, uh, the new uh, a way to build a propeller was uh, very developed by Vogel, Andreas Vogel. Bud Tenney, a well-known indoor modeling enthusiast and expert, was impressed with the Swiss design. The Swiss have a very sophisticated model, technologically sophisticated. They're, 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 their plans are very impressive. You know, we're in for a lot of fun tomorrow. The Swiss first introduced this design at Cardington, England four years ago and their performance has been improving ever since. Dieter Siebenman, designer of the Swiss models, prepares to launch in the first round. Although strategies vary, as a general rule, if you get to the ceiling too quickly, you'll have misused your power and won't have enough left to stay aloft long enough to be competitive. This flight seems to be a bit overcooked, as the British put it. It's climbing out with the prop turning at about 50 RPMs. Dieter may be thinking, that's a little fast. However, if you don't get to the ceiling at all, you may not have enough height for a long flight. Some contestants try to keep their plane near the ceiling for as long as possible, even bouncing around in the rafters. Dieter's model did get to the ceiling and apparently encountered trouble 
as it became inverted and descended upside down after just 12 minutes. The model appears undamaged and will fly again. Rene Booty set the pace in the first round with a flight of 35-34. Rene was by far the most consistent flyer in the championships. He had five flights over 33 minutes. He had this to say about his first flight. I had, uh, I think, too much power on it, and luckily it touched the, the thing in the middle, the plastic, which came down and lost some high. Otherwise, I think it would uh, go too high. Or something. Uh, yeah. And did it climb back up to the mm -hmm. top? Yeah. Le yeah, it did. Luckily. And did it touch? So, no, it didn't just anymore. It was just right. I didn't have to steer it, luckily. <laughs> Rene's second round flight was 33-24 to give him a narrow lead over England's Dave Pym. Each country may enter three contestants. The contestants fly two rounds each day for three days. The best two flights out of six determine individual and team standings. The United States started well with Pete Andrews posting a first round flight of 33-15 and then repeated on the second day with a 33-23 to rank him 10th in the contest. Pete flew a modified version of his famous time machine, which earned him the title world champion in 1972. Jim Richmond has won two individual world championships. He knows this site. He knows his plane. Watch Jim as he launches. He never looks back at his plane. He knows what it's going to do. It's going to go up fast. He's going all out on his first flight, his launch RPM is 48, extremely fast for a Richmond flight. Jim knows he's going to do battle with the rafters and the bandstand, but if the model survives, he could be the leader with a 37-minute flight, and that could change everybody's game plan. Ray Harlan checks Richmond's flight pattern as he prepares to launch. Bill Hubbard, U.S. team manager, clears his watch and is ready to help Ray should he be needed. In U.S. qualifying trials, Ray flew extremely well. He flies a very high-pitched prop with tip flareback. Flying on a stall as he's doing could be very dangerous. However, if the plane can stay aloft and eventually climb over the stall, the time spent near the floor means less rafter banging time near the top. Also flying on a stall slows down the prop considerably. Ray's consuming turns at only 37 revolutions per minute now, and all the turns saved at this point of the flight can be very useful later on. Ray's plane eventually climbed over the stall and headed for the ceiling. Meanwhile, Richmond's plane has reached the bandstand, or the mushroom as the flyers call it, and with the prop count down to about 40 RPMs, it's banging on the plastic sheath, sliding down and recovering. If he can keep this up for the next 10 minutes, he could get that first sensational flight. But it wasn't to be. The plane failed to recover cleanly from one of those bounces off the mushroom and wound up nose down in a power dive. Its delicate wing couldn't stand up to that, and it folded. Watch as Jim catches the model. The wing will pop out and be ready for flight. So Jim Richmond's first flight was seven and a half minutes. And instead of everyone else changing their game plan, Jim had to consider changing his. American Herb Rodemski brought models of three different designs to the championship. In the first round, he selected this ship with V-wing posts, very little dihedral, and no cabane. He was at the ceiling in a hurry. He hung at 10 minutes. Jim Richmond launches his second flight very close to the floor. He recalls what the mushroom did to him on the first flight and leans over a little more. This ship is set up to fly below the trouble, but first it must survive the floor turbulence. In contrast to Jim's first flight, which was all out, this is conservative. This particular setup shows Richmond's ability to pull off the big flight. It 
model is climbing with the prop turning at only 41 revolutions per minute. At 50 feet, he's still climbing at 38 RPM. This flight did not touch anything and was just short of 33 minutes, which placed Jim eighth after two rounds. As Andreas Vogel is about to launch in the second round, he is asked to stop. Ray Harlan is involved in a mid-air collision above him. Harlan is having more than his share of bad luck. His first round flight was only 11 minutes, and now this. Argentina's Eduardo Grippo and Ray exchange apologies. Ray seems to be indicating that this is the second time that this has happened to him. The Americans weren't having a good day up to now, with only Andrews having a score worth keeping. But Irv Radomski changed all that with a sensational flight of 36-23. Irv switched to a more conventional model in the second round. He got some good bounces at the ceiling and brought down a keeper at 36 minutes and 23 seconds. Do you think he's happy? Then in the early evening darkness, Ray Harlan gave the U.S. team something more to cheer about with a flight of 35-49. This was his second round reflight. Contestants are allowed reflights when their planes are knocked down by mid-air collisions as Harlan's was. So the U.S. team, after some early difficulties, came charging to the front and finished with the two best times of the day. Radomski's at 36-23 and Harlan's at 35-49. This is Edward Shapala from Poland and his teammate Rykard Tchaikovsky, world champ in 1974. The Poles always move to the launch spot to wind their motors. Shapala checks the launch torque with a hand torque meter. Both Shapala and Tchaikovsky are experienced international flyers. In 1974, Poland won the team event at Lakehurst, New Jersey. These models are very similar to their 1974 models, with this year's models having a larger wing cord. Shapala's plane climbs slowly on his first flight. This is Edward's model at the top. He's in the preferred orbit, just touching the bandstand's protected plastic skirt inside the rafters. The Canadians look worried. They've just released in the first round. Their plane is climbing with a prop count of about 52 RPMs. It's a bit overpowered and will be at the rafters shortly. Now it's up there, but so is Edward Shapala's, and trouble is brewing. This is the highest flight space in the building. A mid-air collision is one thing that every indoor flyer fears more than anything else. It's so unpredictable. Here Shapala survived his bout with the bandstand and the rafters only to lose when he apparently was out of danger. In the final round, Shapala will go on to record a 35-55 flight and had he not tangled with the Canadian, he might have been the world champion. He finished fourth. This is a member of the Netherlands team. The Dutch Flyers did very well, led by Otto Rodenberg's high time of 33 and a half minutes. The Dutch team held down third place after two days of flying and eventually finished fifth. West Germany sent only two flyers to this championship, Klaus Nadelman and Alfred Klink. Their high times were 26 minutes and 24 minutes respectively. West Germany was once the team to beat and won the championship in 1962 and 1966. Watch this catch. Italy also sent a two-man team. Here, Carlo Cotugno suffers through the initial power burst. His ship climbed over the stall and unfortunately drifted over to the rafters to hang up at 17 minutes. His last flight was his best, 30 and a half minutes.
Two years ago, England won the team championship at Cardington. This is Laurie Barr's first flight. His plane resembles Richmond's Catwalker. To the British, this is a low ceiling, and Laurie shows that he's prepared for this sight by posting a 35 and a half minute flight in round one. This is the first time Argentina has competed in the World Championships. They improved every day. Their best time was 28.15. Dutch flyer Otto Rotenberg uses a protective box to carry his models to the processing area. Teamwork is the forte of the Japanese, and as you can see here, motor winding is a group undertaking. The Japanese brought with them a recently published how-to book, all in Japanese, devoted entirely to indoor, with plans, construction techniques, and flying strategies. The sport of indoor is growing more and more popular each year in Japan. The Japanese posted a sparkling 40-minute flight at the last World Championships, but they couldn't seem to get it together this time with climbs that were consistently too fast. They were always looking up. You can guess what's going to happen hung up again. And who comes to the rescue? The most popular person in the building, Roy White. Roy is a dedicated indoor modeler with no fear of heights, who understands the blood, sweat, and time that goes into building these models. Roy and his anchorman, Mike Stoy, Mike's on the other end of the road, rescued every ensnarled aircraft from the bones of the building, sending them floating gently back to Earth on a balloon string so that they could be flown again. Day two started with thunder showers and the air currents began to churn within the atrium, making the planes behave unpredictably. But after the front pushed through, Dieter Siebenman posted a 34-54 flight, high time for the second day. Teammate Rene Booty also had a good flight, 34-11, increasing his lead to about a minute over England's Dave Pym. So after two days, four rounds, the team standings were Switzerland first, United Kingdom second, Netherlands third, and the United States fourth, over 27 minutes behind the Swiss team. As we move into action on the third and last day of this competition, Laurie Barr is aggressively trying to move his second place British team into the lead with a flight to match his earlier 35 minute effort. But his plane hung up at the rafters after only nine and a half minutes. Irv Radomski has the high single longest flight, 36.23, but his backup flight is only 24 minutes. Will his plane make it over the stall? Irv is permitted to abort the flight within a specified time. He checks his watch. This is a critical point in the flight. With this stall, he's adding important seconds to his flight without consuming many turns. Also, the more time he spends near the floor means less time he must spend at the ceiling. But it's touch and go for a while. Irv's plane did make it over the stall, and when he got to the ceiling, there was more excitement. Spectators Dennis Jakes and Bob Mullins tell the story as they watched Irv's flight. Oh, trouble now. Trouble. He's up higher. He's up higher. Yeah, he is. This is going to be bad, right? This makes okay, now you're all right. This, no. He's all right. Yeah, okay, all right. he passed it. That's right. That's beautiful. That's he right. Got, He's got a tight orbit. It's going to take a long time to catch him. And, uh... Yeah, they uh oh are. They're all right. They're all right. They may end up following each other all the way down. Hopefully. No, I don't think so. I don't, I don't know. Come on down. Come on down. I'd be going crazy. Okay, he is down. The other guy is down. I'd be having a If I couldn't stand it, I'd be having a heart attack. Okay, Herb. Bring her down, Herb. Oh, look at the RPM he's got. Bring yeah, it down, Herb. Really slow down. Bring it down, Herb. See you later. <laughs> Bring her down. Bring her down. Yeah, he's all right now. There's no way that he's going to... Well, no. the game well, isn't over yet until they touch the ground. There's just no, no. But I'm talking about between the two yes. airplanes. I, I think yes. they're all right. Come Can't on. argue that one. Uh, German's going to launch from where he's at? Scares me. 
I'd protest. Ooh, right here? Yes. I don't know. And he's got a hard That airplane goes up like three. Australian Mylan Sitar is soon challenging Rodemski for the top airspace. Irv's plane is cruising at 23 minutes and should turn at least 36 minutes if he can get the plane down. This would put him in the lead for the coveted title, world champion. But right now, he must avoid a collision. Come on! Come on! Come on! Ain't that hell. Ain't that hell. Jeez, what a killer. What a killer. Coming up on 24 minutes right now. Falling. Ain't that second. If you lose a great flight in any contest as the result of a mid-air collision, it's always sickening. But to lose a flight at the World Championships when you have a chance to win it all, well, that's pure agony. Under the watchful eye of David Pym, Great Britain's Bernard Hunt launches in the fifth round. Hunt and Pym have worked for months developing their secret weapon, the variable pitch propeller, the latest in indoor technology. Bernard Hunt explains. It's, uh, it's exactly the same wind as last time, and the conditions aren't, aren't quite as, as yesterday, but the conditions aren't quite as good. So I'm hoping it's just that less, but it ran the turns out easily. You know, it, it had nothing left, so I would think another 10 feet less height would make a minute difference in time. Mm -hmm. A plane with a variable pitch prop need not get to the ceiling to record a good time, because as the plane starts to descend, the prop turns faster giving an extremely long cruise. 16, that's normal. It's not quite on the cruise. Well, of all the air that's in the shed, I'd rather be there than that height for safety. And it's away from that bloody cone. The bloody cone that Bernard refers to is the bandstand. He lost an earlier flight when he hit the plastic sheath and folded the wing. Here, the variable pitch prop is turning faster as Hunt steers his plane away from the palm trees and the statues. The variable pitch props are very complex, but when they are right, they assure a high performance. Dave Pym recorded the fourth highest flight time, 3547, using a variable pitch propeller. Hunt finished fifth to the overall competition with two flights over 34 and a half minutes. The feeling was widespread that the variable pitch propeller may be the wave of the future. The British team didn't have much luck and still finished third using these props. Bernard Hunt and Dave Pym relax after Hunt's 34 and a half minute flight. But for most of the competitors, the third and final day was filled with tension. This is Harlan's plane coming in in the fifth round. Ray is not excited about his 32 minute flight, but as it turned out, this was a very useful flight for the Americans. Without it, the United States team would have finished fifth. This is Rene Booty's plane coming down in the sixth round. Regulations stipulate that each flight have two timers to assure accuracy. This is the final flight of 3506 by Rene Booty of the Swiss team. Combined with his first round effort of 3534, puts him in the lead for individual champion. So the stage is now set for the final act. At noon on the last day, defending champion Jim Richmond, buried in the position of about 20th after four rounds, started to make his bid to defend his title. During lunch break, Jim took advantage of the relatively clear air and posted a spectacular 36-minute flight to give him the second highest single time. Could Jim pull off another world championship in the last round? Well, this is his last flight. Jim's prop count is a very slow 33 RPMs in the cruise. Rene Booty, currently in first place, checks out the competition. Jim needs a 34-24 to take the lead. Jim heads back to his model box to get a steering pole. Contestants are permitted to steer their aircraft away from obstructions using a balloon or pole. Above, his plane ticks off the minutes, descending slowly. 
Jim's last flight was set up to just touch the rafters, but did it have enough power to get the 3424 needed to take over first place? The crowd gathers. He makes it. An unbelievable clutch performance. Richmond records a sixth round time of 35-36 to take the lead by more than a minute. The apparent winner is all smiles as he flies his model back to the box. Two come from behind flights in the last six hours. That's what champions are made of. Congratulations, Jim Richmond. You've done it again. But has he? Here's the situation. Irv Rodemski has the highest single flight time, but Irv's backup time is only 24 minutes. So the United States is in third place, almost 10 minutes behind Switzerland and England. Irv hasn't had much luck. This is the American's last chance, the last flight. Rodemski lets the prop turn several seconds before launching. He's flying the same ship that was knocked out of the air at 24 minutes in the fifth round. He points the nose down to help control the power stall. All eyes are now on Irv Rodemski's plane. Will this flight hit the rafters and hang up? Will he again suffer a mid-air collision? Will he get the 35-minute flight needed to win it all and lead the United States team to victory? We'll let the crowd tell you how he did. Right. With this flight, Irv's total time went up over 11 minutes and he became the indoor world champion. The United States team jumped from third to first. All this in the final hours of the three-day contest. Irv has worked hard for this moment. He designed and tested at least 15 different planes over the last two years. During the team selection trials, he finished fourth and was voted the most improved flyer. He joined the three-man team when one member withdrew. At West Baden, he won the high single flight trophy and with Harlan and Andrews, the team trophy. So for the next two years, he will carry the title world champion.